Uh, good, still morning for one more minute, uh, everybody. There are only going, there are only three uh, individuals signed up for this listening session. So rather than do a, uh, a call on speakers and unmute, we're just going to ask you all to be panelists. So when you receive the invitation on your screen to be, to be a panelist, just accept it and then you'll be able to speak freely during the session. And we will start in just a minute. We are waiting on one more and we'll only wait for a few seconds before we start. All right, well, we'll go ahead and get started. Uh, thanks so much to both of you for joining. Uh, we hope that the third attendee will be with us shortly. Uh, we appreciate you coming to the listening sessions. We really don't have anything to say except to remind you that the Nakubo report, which I assume both of you have had a chance to look at, uh, the Nakubo report was prepared by external consultants. The recommendations contained therein are not recommendations of the staff to the Board of Regents, they're recommendations of the consultants to us. And what we're doing in these sessions is getting your feedback on the recommendations that were provided by Nakubo. So we have not made final determinations as to what we will bring to the Board of Regents uh, in terms of policy recommend changes for recommendations for policy changes. We are listening to you all first. We are going through an extensive process to determine what our recommendations will be. This is the first step in the process, which is gathering feedback from campuses. We have the listening sessions. There's one more after this one. The two that preceded this one have been videoed and they're now available uh, the same place, the same announcement where you signed up for this session. So you are free to go and watch those at your convenience if you are interested in what other people are saying. Um, so, and then we are also accepting written feedback. We just got a letter today uh, from one of the systems and anyone is welcome to provide us written feedback on the Nakubo recommendations. All of that will feed into the recommendations that will be developed by staff. We will share those out before we finalize and get more feedback from you. Uh, and then we will share with the Board of Regents and make sure that we share with the Board of Regents both our recommendations and the feedback we've received from all of the stakeholders who provided feedback during this process. So with that, uh, we put up on the screen just the major recommendations, the summary recommendations from the Nakubo report. If you've read it, you know that there are lots more recommendations than just these, uh, but these are the big ones. These are the ones that have generated the most interest. So we will leave that up and invite you to make any comments that you have. You can unmute, you can unmute yourself at will and uh, say whatever is on your mind. I'll go, uh, Carrie. This is uh, Susan Chapel with ULM. Uh, I thought the report was well done, and I agree for the most part with the uh, recommendations. I did find that, based on historic um, performance and reporting, ULM did not match what the findings were with regard to vacancies. Um, years vacant or even percentages um, or superior graduate student scholarships or the um, first gens award rates. Uh, so I, I, was in, I was encouraged by the fact that uh, the university has really had a strong focus on making sure that there were holders in all of these endowed faculty positions and that scholarships were being utilized. Um, 
but the recommendations that the uh, reviewers made made a lot of sense um, with regard to boosting the minimum corpus level in endowed chairs. I think that would be very advantageous for the larger universities who have probably a bigger pool of private donor resources. I don't know that it makes sense from a smaller school like ULM because getting $600,000 in private funds is pretty much a challenge for us already um, and boosting that up even higher. A um, million dollars makes a huge difference at ULM. <laughs> so might not be so much um, at some of the larger universities, but I see the point, the, the logic in it. I really, really liked the uh, endowed school college or departmental funds in place of professorships or um, as an alternative for a match. The deans seem to need more and more funds that they can use, especially for travel and, and research. And um, that's not necessarily, you know, just for the dean, but for their whole program. And I really liked that approach of endowing a fund for a school or a college or a department in, in, instead of a professorship. So um, all the other recommendations I thought were very reasonable and thought out. Um, removing the restriction for work study for first gen students made a lot of sense since they don't, there are working jobs and they're highly used here at ULM, especially in conjunction with our TRIO program. Um, which provides a lot of the mentoring necessary for these first-time students to college that don't have the resources at home to help them through some of the challenges. Great. And in terms of the match rate, we are internally, we have been thinking again, Susan, you've been around a while, so I think that you, you've seen us try this in the past. We are thinking in terms of uh, a tiered approach Mm -hmm. rather than changing a one size fits all, which is what we have now to say that there are some, there are some disciplines and there are some institutions where a million dollars is entirely appropriate. There are some disciplines and some institutions where it's not. Gotcha. And we should recognize that in policy and in practice. Great. Jeremy, what do you have? What do you think about the, the report? Well, I, I was hoping to come in and just listen more than participate being, I still say somewhat new, but um, my first instinct when I saw it was, man, you know, we're nickels. It's not going to be easy to participate with larger amounts. It's already a challenge in a lot of ways with private donors uh, to get to those higher amounts. So I'm glad that's being something that's um, looked into and, um, it, it's the timing. I think also when you talk about the kind of creating the Dean's discretionary fund, uh, I have a, a donor. It's just, it's the time I say timing's perfect. Um, a donor gave a half, gave a million dollars. Ironically, say I'm talking about not having million dollar donors. <laughs> I have a donor who's doing a million dollars. Um, half of that is going towards a new facility for baseball. And the other half is academics. And what he chose, he's a, an attorney, but history degree, met with the Dean of Liberal Arts, and what we're doing with that other half a million is creating the College of Liberal Arts Excellence Fund, which will be basically a Dean's discretionary fund to help with everything from travel to equipment and facilities and helping with students, some scholarships and so forth. So I love that idea. And I think um, I think donors and alums of institutions would like that as well. Uh, and again, first gen, anything we can do to create more first generation scholarships, uh, we, we're still, I think, over 60 percent first generation students. Um, so whatever we can do along those lines, I'm very much in support of. But my whole thing, again, was when it started off, when I first glanced and first read with my understanding of everything was if those are amounts when, when I saw as comparable to other institutions in the Southeastern Conference. I thought, all right, well, we can't compete with them in athletics and we definitely can't compete with them in donations. So when we're comparing all of our institutions in Louisiana to Southeastern Conference institutions, it, it just makes it too hard for everybody else. Yeah, and I think you know, what, what we face on a programmatic level 
is even at a million dollars, we can't compete with the Southeastern Conference institutions, but we can put ourselves in a better position, but a position that does not jeopardize the funding for regional institutions, smaller institutions, institutions without historic donor bases at the level of, of say the flagship campus while ensuring that the flagship campus and big research universities are, are getting a level of endowment that makes sense in the broader context. But we definitely don't have any interest in or appetite for reducing the availability of matching funds broadly across the state for every institution type. Now, I will say something also about endowed professorships, and that donor did not want his funds or really wouldn't want his funds going to create a professorship. However, with that being said, and like I've, I've never been faculty, so I'm just going based on what I hear. I, I really am floored with how excited a lot of these faculty are to be awarded, uh, you know, that endowed professorship. And you know, I look at it, I'm thinking, well, you know, you're not getting that much of a raise. I mean, I know you're getting a raise and I know you have funds, but I wouldn't want to see it go away. Um, you know, there's not a lot of great morale, I find, with with faculty, except with things like this. I, I, the, the excitement level I see when they get awarded it or part of it and like to have that on their email, you know, whatever chair they are, professorship they hold. So just from my, I can, I can say kind of outsider looking in here, I don't know if I want to see it completely go away. Um, I'm just thinking the morale of faculty at, at places like Nichols. Well, with a, with a discretionary fund or with a departmental approach, that can be a decision made by a department that the thing that we want to endow or a donor, the thing I want to endow is an individual faculty slot. Uh, but what... What we see with professorships in particular, to some degree with chairs, but especially with professorships, when Chris and I get questions, a lot of the questions are around how can we basically use these funds outside of that individual single faculty member holder professorship utility? Like if we buy a piece of equipment, does only that person get to use it or could we use it more broadly? Could we support a student if we have a particular student uh, who needs support? Could we use it for that purpose? And we, we try to say we wrote the guidance on utility of the funds very broadly. So depending on how the donors define the professorship, you can use it for say, a faculty member who's not the holder to attend a conference. If that is consistent with the purpose of the professorship and you can show how that expenditure is supporting the professional work of the professorship holder. For example, if the professorship holders department chair, then the department chair's faculty going to a conference, totally appropriate, totally supportive, as long as the donor hasn't said something that contradicts that, that usage. This would just basically institutionalize that, that breadth of opportunity. A donor can still restrict it uh, pretty broadly. Uh, and this just gives more flexibility in how the funds could be used. And the donor could even restrict it to the point that this is going to create the Joe Blow professorship in X discipline. And that name will go with the funding. It, it's just an opportunity to provide more flexibility for for campuses and departments to get what they need. Thank you. I like that. Yeah. It's also, you know, I, you may not like this part so much, but some campuses have more professorships than professors. Uh, some campuses are almost maxed out. And so there's not any utility in creating more of these slots that yeah. would give an opportunity for those campuses to continue to, to receive our, matching dollars. Our, our college of business is pretty much maxed out with it, but we have other colleges that hardly have any. Um, 
I do have one that I, I got a donor who's going to do a $2 million gift from their estate, but they're both still have quite a few years left on them. And it's going to create 10. It, the idea was to create 10 professorships. Um, <clears throat> five would be in liberal arts and five would be in the college of education. So, you know, but like I said, we not, we might not see those funds for another 20 years. Um, right. But that was be part of their, their gift. Uh, but yeah, I understand how other universities would be maxed out. Yeah, and that, of course, that's the problem when you look at the net numbers. I mean, I can show you, I have prepared slides. Oh, I can't move the slides, so that's fine. Um, but yeah, when you look at the net numbers, it's a huge, huge program and a huge amount of money. Go back to this. But a lot of those are concentrated. They're concentrated in specific disciplines. They're concentrated... In, on specific campuses. And so we do understand that looking at it holistically gives you a very different picture than looking at it when you're on an individual campus looking across what you've got. So we're, we're also trying to be sensitive to, to opening up opportunities while we don't take opportunities away, if you will. Harry, to that, uh, point has there been in the prior sessions I haven't listened to them but has there been any or is there an opportunity to um, be more apply the program more in line with other states that they examined to where private institutions are not party to this matching funds we have an issue with the private with with the Lake U campus participation in that it's in the constitution uh, and we have attorney general's opinions. When you read the constitutional language, it, which you've probably done, it says uh, there are the four constitutional areas of the support fund, which are endowment of chairs for eminent scholars, uh, recruitment of superior graduate students, targeted research and development, and uh, enhancement of research, agricultural, and academic departments and units. In those in, in those four, the first one is targeted research and development, and it says targeted research and development on public and private in, at public and private institutions. And the attorney general's office has ruled multiple times that that act, that language carries across all four programs. So we can't restrict Lake U campuses out of programs of the support fund. They have to be, they have to participate. What we do in chairs is we restrict the level at which they can participate. So if you look at the chairs policy, each public campus is limited to 1.2 million in match per year. So a public campus can't get more than 1.2 million. All the Lake U campuses combined have that threshold of or that that limit of 1.2 million. So at the point that Lake U reaches 1.2 million, regardless of whether it's one campus or three, they're out. And we'll I was thinking more like the the matches that Tulane receives. They're huge. I mean, they get a 1.8 million dollar donor. They take all the the money because they're private. Right, and they can't take all the money. What the what the chairs people have actually done, what the chairs reviewers have done in the last few years, because the budget is so low and the support fund. The revenues are not recovering. Uh, we were at our lowest level since 1988 in terms of right. revenues total, not adjusted for inflation total. Yeah. Uh, but what they've started to do is cut down those requests. So if, if any campus submits a $1.2 million chair, they'll recommend one match at 400000 with an opportunity to come back for further matching in another year. Uh, but we are we don't have the ability to remove them from the competitions. We could certainly look at ways to to further restrict the total amount they could receive in a year, uh, but we can't remove them. I like the recommendation for the agreed upon procedures to be every other year. It's quite intensive and expensive to pay auditors for that. Something about that. uh, that's that's that is something that we're considering. We're working to 
revamp our instructions on AUP, make them more detailed and get them, get the reports to be more uniform across the campuses. Mm -hmm. uh, once we have that, we, we're going to see how the institutions uh, perform in their audits for a cycle and then revisit that recommendation to say if, if we're comfortable with the structure that the AUP is at, then we might be, we'll be more willing to allow institutions to have a, a, an annual reprieve from it if, if you're performing well in your reports. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Promoted. Uh, Chandler, you are listening in. I think we are promoting, there are only three participants on the call. So we're promoting everyone to a panelist. You'll receive a, rec uh, a, you'll receive a request to approve that. So just approve it and you'll be in. Any other comments while we wait for Chandler to join? All right, Chandler, I see you in. You should be able to unmute yourself and make any comments you'd, you'd like to make. We are, um, we're just taking comments. These are listening sessions, so we're just taking comments. Uh, great, well, I don't know that I have any additional comments than what we've shared in writing, but I'd wanted to definitely listen in and uh, provide any comments if there were any that came up along the way on behalf of our community and technical college system. Okay, I think the major things we've discussed uh, that particularly related to what we've talked about before with the uh, community and technical colleges is the idea of tiering um, match rates so that smaller campuses, campuses with smaller donor bases aren't disadvantaged. Uh, so any increase in, in, uh, in matching, any increase in corpus levels, we would propose a tiered system to address those that's correct so that that's been a big issue and we've talked a little bit about how uh the departmental enhancement might work in terms of donors and campuses who still want professorships rather than moving to discretionary departmental dollars and and we indicated that what we're, what we're looking at is if we move to a system like that, it would still be possible to create professorships within that structure, uh, but that would be based on donor preference and campus preference negotiated out with the donors. Great, thank you for that update. Absolutely. So are there any other comments you'd like to make? Any of you? Mm -hmm. All right, hearing nothing, uh, we will give you some time back on your day and we really appreciate your participation. Please note this, this is being recorded. We will edit the recording and post it. We'll just edit out any dead space and post it uh, on the announcement of the sessions. You are welcome to listen to the other two sessions that have preceded this, as well as the session that will happen next week, and all of those will be available to you for your review, and we'll be reaching out sometime in November with some draft language for you to look at and give us feedback on as we move through this process. Thank you so much. Have a good day. Thank you.